Welcome back to Let's Read Darksiders, the Abomination Vault. I'm Burning Dog Face, and uh, last time we checked out Chapter 4, in which War was given a very special mission by the Charred Council, one he seems likely to enjoy. This time, we're checking back in with Death, but not before a pit stop along the way. Chapter 5 Stupid. Unbelievably stupid. Though her words were accusatory, even petulant, Belisatra's tone was flat and cold as a frozen lake. Only the fingers of her left hand, drumming a chiming beat on her armored thigh, gave any further indication of her exasperation. They left smears of semi-congealed blood to those fingertips. The only remaining trace of recent distasteful experimentations. Her companion sat by the work table, slumped bonelessly in a rickety chair that was clearly not long for this world, and old enough that it probably looked forward to going. In his lap, Black Mercy lay like a sodden lump of flesh, too grotesque to keep too morbidly fascinating to throw away. The triple cylinders turned constantly beneath his restless fingers. Click. 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 It was worth the risk, he said finally. Belly Satra glared at his hunched shoulders as he seemed determined not to turn and face her directly. Worth the risk? The ice in her voice was now sharp enough to draw blood. You compromised our entire effort! The White City knows of our interest in Eden now! They've seen some of our best soldiers in action, and for what? My pets came nowhere near to reaching the gate, let alone breaking. He had trouble hearing her, absorbing the meaning of her words only several long breaths after she spoke them. For centuries, he'd had so little room in his soul for anything beyond bitter regret and simmering fury at what had been done to him and to... to others. He was accustomed to that, perhaps even found some comfort in it. But now, something was stoking those fires, something new, his memories felt smothered in a stifling call. The world around him tinged a venomous purple by the putrid hatred bubbling up through the cracks between his thoughts. Only the dead weight of the pistol felt real. Only black mercy looked stable in the center of his wavering vision. Click. Click. I saw an opening... And I took it, he said slowly, cutting the maker off in midstream. The knowledge we might have gained to say nothing of more tangible prizes made it worth the gamble. Yes, we lost, but consider what we've learned. Your drones are of little use against angels, save in great numbers, but your myrmidons are far more effective. We know now what sorts of tactics the White City is likely to employ in its defensive bastions. And we know that the Charred Council has, as yet, no notion of what we're after. And just how do you figure that? Belisatra asked. Because Eden was guarded only by angels, not by any of the horsemen. Hmm, fair, but we can't count on that lasting. And Heaven will certainly have reinforced the Garden's defenders at this point. We've lost our shot. Our shot at Eden, yes, but only temporarily. And besides, Eden was never our only option. True, but... The fever was actually squeezing him, reaching out with great tendrils so it might crush his mind to its breast and feel his thoughts burning. He'd begun to sweat across his forehead, his neck, but not his hands. His hands were steady, cool, comfortable on Black Mercy's grip. Enough for now. He refrained from shouting, not out of any desire to remain diplomatic with his ally, but simply because he lacked the energy to both remember the meaning of the words and spit them with any real vehemence. 
I believe you have some constructs to replace before our next attempt, don't you? Belly Satra grumbled something unintelligible and swept from the room, the heavy steel of her armor adding its own metallic voice as she vanished down the corridor. Behind her, her ally remained beside the table and its scattered tools, sagging in his chair, fixated wholly on the only thing remaining in his sight, in his mind, perhaps even in his soul. Click. The snow was the brown green of marsh water, rather than traditional white or even slushy gray. It even smelled vaguely stagnant, not that there were many creatures around to notice. It fell in thick flurries, some of which seemed to ride their own individual winds that spawn in utter disregard for the weather patterns mere paces away. Everywhere it fell, it froze almost instantly into ice, painting abstract patterns of dull hue across the landscape. And it fell so swiftly that Death, who had crouched in this particular spot for only a few moments, was already half-buried and otherwise coming to resemble just another small geological feature of the terrain. He lurked low on the slope of a mountain so astoundingly massive that it was impossible, from any distance, to view both the base and the summit at once. Several protrusions of stone jutted from the slopes, a few of them large enough to qualify as mountains in their own right. And this was but one of an entire range forming a wall in the world, and creating steep valleys and gorges where so many Nephilim and so many demons had fallen long and long ago. Jagged rock, eternal winter, and a surface of ice some hundreds or even thousands of hands in depth. This was all the ancient battle had left of the fields of Cothysos. Within those valleys, swarming across floors of ice and snowy slopes, were those six-limbed beasts of stone of which the departed angel had told him, hordes upon hordes of them, transforming all Cothysos into one enormous anthill of industry. That they were, indeed, scavenging the ancient battlefield, death could have no doubt. Their forelimbs were transformed into digging tools. Shovels and picks, for the most part, save when they hauled something from the ice. He had not yet seen any trace of the stone and brass warriors, nor any sign of a living mind directing the lesser automatons. The things seemed relatively unobservant as well as unintelligent, so long as he remained on the slopes high above and let the snow do most of the work, remaining concealed ought to be simple enough. Ready? he asked, his voice almost lost to the falling snow and cracking ice. Dust, who was currently little more than a puffy ball of disheveled black feathers, huddled beneath the horseman's chest, replied with an ugly look and a single resigned squawk. A little cold won't hurt you. And then, fascinating, I didn't know a beak could scowl like that. It was a slow and frustrating, if not particularly difficult, journey. The snow was thick enough, and death silent enough, that none of the constructs below came close to spotting him. The treacherous terrain impeded his progress only slightly, and this far down the slopes, the rocky protrusions were usually near enough for the horsemen to leap successfully from mountainside to mountainside. No, the difficulty arose when moving among those mountains that didn't stand near enough to one another to allow for an easy crossing. Death did, despite his supernatural strength and agility, have limits to how far he could jump. In these instances, when the only option was climbing to ground level and crossing through the small valleys, the horseman is forced to scuttle around to the far side of the slopes and work his way behind the laboring constructs. Not even a sizable group of the things would pose him much of a danger, but battling a few meant risking the attention of all, and that would prove, at the very least, inconvenient. Until, after arduous hours of painstaking progress trailing the encumbered drones back to their central repository, stealth finally ceased to be an option. 
tucked into a smaller valley that formed a tributary off the main chasm, a perfect circle, roughly thrice death's height and diameter, had been melted into the permafrost. Whatever had occurred here had happened some time ago, and much of the hollow had already filled in with fresh ice and snow, but the outline remained clearly visible. Death would have guessed, even without his extraordinary senses, that he was looking at the remains of a gate between realms. The fact that he could feel the weakness in the walls of reality, a fresh scab over a wound in the world, merely confirmed that assessment. Beside the remnants of the gate, a hill of snow bulged like a blister from the ice. It, too, was clearly fresh. Death watched one of the stone constructs approach with a lump of something, he could not from here make out what it might be, and place it on the hillside, where it was swiftly covered up. As he'd suspected, then. This was where the diggers were storing whatever it was they chipped from the permafrost. The stockpile was only lightly guarded. Suspiciously so, in fact. While new drones appeared every few minutes in order to deliver their payloads, they departed just as swiftly. Only a contingent of five remained nearby at all times, winding in a complex patrol around and around the hill. Death considered the situation for some time, again allowing the snow to blanket him. Were the enemy, whoever they might be, truly so overconfident, so foolish, as to assume the operation here would never be troubled? Had they overextended themselves, stretching their resources too thin? Or... Given the depth to which they had already delved into the ice, the relatively small prizes they delivered to the stockpile, the length of time between discoveries, perhaps the operation was nearly complete. He'd known that they must have been here for some while before the invasion of Eden. Otherwise, they'd not have had time to unearth affliction, not when the Nephilim themselves had been unable to locate the sword. But he hadn't realized how long. The stockpile wasn't guarded well, because the enemy had already retrieved whatever prizes they expected to find, and moved the bulk of their efforts elsewhere. The remainder was just meticulousness, in case they'd missed something. So he was far too late to stop them from accomplishing their goals, at least here in the fields of Cothysos. But death would be damned to the depths of the abyss if he'd leave without finding out what the enemy were after. And still, he hoped, would perhaps have prayed, had he any remnants of faith left to him, that he was wrong. All of which meant that he had to get a look at whatever it was that lay hidden beneath the snowy mound below. Death had no way of telling how long it would be before the next constructs arrived. They appeared not at set intervals, but whenever they unearthed something of worth to deliver. Still, a few moments, at least, usually passed between arrivals. All he could do was to time the patrol of the five who lingered and hope. Two drones appeared, made their deliveries, wandered off once more. Three of the patrolling constructs were positioned near enough to one another, and it was time. From a jutting outcrop of frost-slick stone, harvester spinning in lazy circles, death leapt. He landed hard on the middle of the three guards, crushing it deep into the snow and ice. The impact alone might have been sufficient to shatter the magics that animated it, but death is never to know. He landed on a crouch, not merely on his feet, but on his left hand, a hand that clutched half of Harvester now formed into an impossibly thick and long-bladed knife that punched through the rock as easily as flesh. The runes scribed across the drone's body flared brightly and died. Even as he landed, Death leaned to the right and thrust with his second weapon, currently in the form of a long, narrow spear. It, too, blasted through the carapace, this time at the construct to his right. The wound itself was narrow, not sufficient to kill instantly. The thickening of the haft and the blade punching through the construct from within, as Death allowed the two weapons to meld back into a single scythe, were sufficient. The last of the three, to Death's other side, had only just turned to face him when the horseman swung Harvester overhead, right to left, the dead drone still impaled upon the blade. It crashed into its target, slicing stone, and both bodies cracked into scores of lifeless chunks. 
Three down, and the snow kicked up at Death's Landing hadn't yet settled back to Earth. The last pair of drones, the two that had not been standing just beside the others, instantly split off in opposite directions. One moved towards the intruder at a rapid charge, while the other scurried off behind the nearest stone outcropping. Whether to work its way around and attack from behind or to fetch reinforcements, Death couldn't know. A quick mental call, and then Death's left fist shot outward. Again, Harvester had split, as swiftly as its wielder could think it, now forming the familiar pair of smaller scythes. One spun from the horseman's hand, whistling as it flew, and two of the charging drone's legs fell from its body at the blade's kiss. It tumbled hard, sending up a puff of snow. It shuddered, struggling to drag itself forward with its arms and its one remaining pair of legs. The scythe flew from beneath its bulk to merge once more with its other half, meeting death in midair as his second leap carried him from the carapace of one drone to the side of another. Harvester was now a square-headed maul, a hammer so oversized it was almost, almost comical. Although the wounded creature crushed beneath its bulk, shattered into granules and tiny chunks that were swiftly buried by the swirling snows, probably wouldn't have thought so. A sepulchral wail arose from nearby, and only death recognized the sound for what it was. The fifth and final construct hurtled back into view, trailing tiny slivers of stone. It landed on its back, legs thrashing, exposing a pair of hoof-shaped impressions gouged into its chest. It might easily have uh, flipped itself over with its arms, had death not casually brought them all down once more, pulverizing the thing. Harvester was a scythe once more before the dust settled. Thank you, Death said. Despair snorted, trotting from around the outcropping, churning snow and drifting mists clouding its hooves. Dust! Dust stuck his head out from where he'd buried himself in Despair's stringy mane. Death hadn't the first idea when the crow had sheltered there, and wasn't about to give the wretched little beast the satisfaction of showing his surprise. Make yourself useful, bird. Keep an eye out for anyone coming our way. Then, after a brief but vitriolic tirade of screeches, Yes, it's cold and windy and you won't be able to see very far. Do it anyway. Death waited until the angry squawking had faded, directed Despair to stand guard at the largest entry to the offshoot valley, and once more planted Harvester shaft first in the snow. At a languid pace that might in anyone else have signified reluctance, he approached the hill of snow. He raised his arms, hands outstretched as though to rip the clouds from the sky. Sounds that were scarcely syllables, let alone words, rolled dully from behind the faceless mask. A trio of ghouls, very much like those he'd left working on his home, burst from the snow as though they'd been buried here rather than worlds away. Instantly they fell to, chucking snow between their legs with both hands, very much like digging dogs. A second chant and skeletal arms slithered up from below, also working to scoop away the thick, freezing skin of the hill. And finally, Death lowered his left arm, reaching out with his right, the air blurred and darkened, rather like clear water filling slowly with ink. The blackness spread, bulging and growing, until it formed a ghostly hand many times the size of Death's own. Darkness dripped from its hazy borders, tendrils of shadow linked it to the horseman's own fingers. With slow but steady strokes, the massive appendage made swift work of the mound's slope. In a surprisingly short time, the guts of the artificial hillock were exposed to the open air. Death snapped his fist shut, dispersing the hand of shadow and dispatching the skeletal limbs back whence they came. The ghouls he chose to maintain a while longer, sending them to aid despair in guarding against unwanted company. The bulk of the stockpile consisted of demonic corpses, frozen and preserved since the days of the Nephilim Rampage. A few of them, disturbed by the digging, tumbled off the heap to sprawl near Death's feet. Most were imps, the lowest of the demonic castes. Flame callers, dusk wings, the occasional shadow caster, these he ignored. A rare few were of greater power, primarily the Knights of Perdition and their Hellspawn mounts twisted shadows of the horsemen themselves. And these he carved apart with Harvester, 
just in case a spark of life might linger even after all the gruesome wounds and all the centuries. Why the enemy would want the bodies of the demons gathered, the writer wasn't certain. Study? Examination of their fangs and claws or the wounds that had killed them? A search, perhaps, for weapons or parts of weapons that might have been lost inside their victims? Or simply, a means of clearing them out of the way for a more arduous, meticulous search? He dug deeper, ignoring the acrid stench of dead demon, clear through the freezing ice and the thick oozing sludge that had once been half a dozen varieties of unnatural blood. And at first, he was relieved. Blades and cannons, pistols and shields, and all manner of far more peculiar devices. These he found, mostly in bits and broken slivers, only occasionally whole. Yes, they might have located affliction this way, and perhaps a few other usable weapons, but nothing nearly so catastrophic as he'd feared. Hope was not a feeling to which death was accustomed. He rarely had any reason to hope for anything, and even more rarely was he sufficiently optimistic to do so. But he began to hope now, to believe that just maybe he'd grown alarmed over nothing. It was a pleasant feeling for the precious few moments it lasted, until he reached the innermost layers of the construct's stockpile. They were almost invisible among the demon corpses. A few strips of leathery flesh, molded into handles and grips, mechanical components of bone and steel, the one blending seamlessly into the other, and even smaller bits, unrecognizable save for the quivers of wrath and loathing death felt beneath his touch. Pieces, but no traces of the whole. So, the enemy had found at least one of them. Still, they might not know what they had, might think it just another peculiar artifact of that long-ago war, and they almost certainly couldn't know how to use it, how to wake it up. Almost certainly. For some time, Death stood and stared, unseeing, at the pile of refuse that was swiftly being reclaimed by the falling snow. Stared and deliberated. He could search for leaders among the constructs, living beings who directed their operations. But such a plan didn't offer great odds of success. If there were any such commanders present, they'd almost certainly have been here, at the center of it all. No more likely, now that the drones were clearly in the final stages of their endeavors here, they'd simply been left with instructions while the true enemy moved on to the next stage in their schemes. Try to follow them? He, in despair, could certainly step through the walls of the world. But even Death's powers and senses couldn't tell him where that gate had led. Wait for it to become active once more, and either ambush those who appeared, or follow them back to their point of origin? Eh, workable, except that the horseman had no way of knowing how long that might be. He could find himself sitting around accomplishing nothing for quite some time, and again, all that while the enemy's own strategies would be advancing apace. No, he'd have to act now. He was just contemplating a journey to the realm of the Charred Council itself, where he might beg their assistance in tracking the absent gate's destination, much as he hated being reliant on them, or anyone else, really, when the decision was abruptly taken out of his hands. Still circling above, fighting the drafts with wings dusted in filthy snow, dust went berserk. Piercing cries rent the air in the ears, high and angry, sharp as Harvester itself. The black-feathered shape plummeted, falling as much as diving, pulling up at only the last instant before he would have plowed painfully into the mountainside. He circled death over and over, wings flapping with unnecessary fury, squawking so frantically he must surely bring the rest of the Construct army down to their heads. That, and quite possibly an avalanche of prodigious proportions. What? What? This was no mere alarm, no warning of a few approaching enemies. Of that death was certain. As the crow refused to calm, the horseman watched, timing his flight, and then snatched him from the air with an impossibly swift hand. And very nearly let the bird go again. Death staggered back with an involuntary cry as a barrage of images crashed through his mind. Blood. Pain. Flashing blades. Jagged paths and winding stairs. 
stone columns taller than any mountain, precarious ledges overlooking a drop so high that clouds drifted below as they passed, unnatural lights of violet hues, and flocks so thick they choked the sky, a great hall impossibly vast, a broad floor slick with ice and a god-like dais. Everywhere, everywhere, the fluttering of black feathers and the endless screech of an avian chorus of thousands strong. And at the center of it all, a face of impossible age, lined and leathered as a well-worn saddle, bushy of beard though bald of pate, a face death knew well. The waking dream faded, the world of ice and snow coming once more into focus. Death peered down at the crow, now huddled, shaking, but no longer frantically flapping in his open palm. "'I was not aware,' he said darkly, "'that you and he still shared any sort of link. "'Funny how he didn't bother to mention that when he bound you to me!' Dust cawed miserably. "'I should leave him to his own fate,' the horseman muttered. "'But even as he spoke he knew he wouldn't. "'Not because he felt any particular affinity.' but because the old one, perhaps the oldest of the old ones, could prove useful. And even more, because the blades appearing in the series of images, though seen only briefly, looked very much to him like brass, like the malleable limbs that a four-armed gilded soldier Sarasael's spirit had described. The ghouls death had summoned collapsed back into the snow and out of Cothysos entirely. Despair appeared an instant later in response to the horseman's silent call. "'Very well, Dust,' Death said. "'Let's see what dares to trouble your father in his own home. And maybe, depending on what he decides to tell me, I'll be able to decide whether I should assist him or kill him myself.'" And that will do it for Chapter 5. Things are getting really interesting now, especially with the addition of a not-so-friendly face from Darksiders 2. Interesting. Well, I'm Burning Dog Face, and the story will continue on the next episode of Let's Read Darksiders The Abomination Vault. But like I said, I'm trying to ease back into videos, so I'm not actually sure if we'll be continuing with that next, or if I will be attempting to return to Let's Play Control. Either way, I hope you've enjoyed listening, and uh, I hope you have yourselves a great day, Burning Dog fans. Till next time, later!